I've been getting a few comments recently asking me to make another scientific video, which makes me very happy as I love science, especially theoretical science as it's the most fun to do research on. However, today we're going to talk about something that I've been interested in for a very, very long time, and this is quantum computers. Most of us have heard about quantum computers, and if you don't know what they are, the definition of a quantum computer is a computer that makes use of quantum states of subatomic particles to store information. And if you look up the definition of quantum computing, it reads, quantum computing studies theoretical computation systems, quantum computers, that make direct use of quantum mechanical phenomena such as superposition and entanglement, to perform operations on data. Quantum computers are different from binary digital electronic computers based on transistors. Now this is a lot to take in, so I'm going to break this down a bit. <laughs> You'll get that later. Computers are, especially by my community, very well known to us all. One thing we notice is computers are getting smaller as the new generations come out. And despite their size, the power of our computers are doubling and tripling every time we upgrade. However, according to Moore's law, there will come a point where technology will no longer be able to get any faster. We'll reach a limit on the speed, size, and performance unless we find a workaround. Before I delve more into Moore's law, I need to explain how computers do what they do, otherwise the rest of this isn't going to make any sense. How computers work is a very sophisticated process, however, I'm going to try to break it down and make it simple. Computers are made up of circuit chips, those are made up of modules, those are made up of something called logic gates, and those are made up of transistors. Now all of these alone are very basic, but together they form the very thing that makes your computer function the way it does. A transistor is basically an on and off switch that allows information to pass through. The information is known as bits, and bits can only be set to 0 or 1 and bits are used together to represent complex information. Now transistors are combined into logic gates. The information that are passed through these form modules and those can be used to add and multiply. These form the final steps and what the whole chip is comprised of. Now that was the hard part and really you don't need to know that by heart to understand the next part so don't worry if that was a tad crazy. So let's go back to Moore's law. Transistors, the switches I talked about before, are used to send information around but its means of doing so is by a flow of electrons. Because computers are getting so small, the transistors that make up these chips are about 14 nanometers. To put that into perspective, the hydrogen atom is about 0.1 nanometers, and a red blood cell is about 6,000 to 8,000 nanometers. So we're making transistors smaller than a red blood cell. But the issue is that because they're so small, electrons have the ability to just phase through these transistors through a process called quantum tunneling. And because of this, we have no way of controlling those electrons as we would like to, at least not without keeping computers at the same size they are now. Now you may ask, what's the issue with that? Well, the smaller these transistors are, the faster they can push electrons through and the faster our information is displayed. But because of this, Moore's law will come to fruition unless we attain the ability to build quantum computers. Now, I talked about bits before. These are the smallest units of information, and again, they can only be set to zero or one. Quantum computers would use qubits that also would only be set to the same two values. Based on the polarization of this bit, its dedicated number, zero or one, will be found. But in the quantum world, this is vastly different than the predictable one we live in. These qubits can be in any state any proportion it wants to. This is known as superposition. However, as soon as you test the qubit, it has to decide whether it wants to be a zero or a one, and it will become that definitive position. However, until it's tested, it remains in a state of superposition, and after it's done being tested, it will go back to being superposition. And because of this very thing, it has more power than the regular bit by a crazy margin. For example, let's say you have four bits. Those four bits can be in a random sequence of one and zero, but only at 16 combinations. And out of those 16 combinations, you can only use one. However, those four qubits can be in all of those 16 superpositions at once. So testing the regular bits means you have to wait for them all to decide what they are, then pick the combination they're going to be. And though this is done fast, imagine how much faster it would be if the combination was in qubits and already available as soon as you asked for it. 
Now another thing qubits have over regular bits is called entanglement. This is when two qubits will react in a change of one another's state instantaneously, meaning if you measure one qubit that is entangled with another, you don't need to try and test the other qubit because it's already been tested and its state is already known to you. So because of this property, you get all of the information you want at the exact same time. On a normal computer, it has to measure one set of bits at a time and try and try and try again until the correct one is found. But with a quantum computer, all the bits are tested instantaneously and all of them display the correct information. Now what will this help us in? How is quantum computing going to affect our lives? Well, there are lots of ways. You know those TV shows where the cops are running someone's face through a database and it takes a few hours, sometimes days to find a match? Well, with quantum computing, this would find that person in no time flat. Almost any and every database would be able to calculate at a revolutionarily high percentage in accuracy. Another amazing use would be security. As of right now, we use encryption to hide and decode your information. This makes it hard for people to break in because they're using the same computer you are, and depending on the decryption, it'll take years to decode. On a quantum computer, however, this would be a piece of cake, but quantum computing would also make everything much more secure as we normal consumers probably wouldn't have quantum computers at our disposal. So hacking a decryption made by a quantum computer would be literally impossible. Another thing quantum computers could do is revolutionize medicine. The issues we run into right now on our computers is trying to simulate how diseases, proteins, and viruses do what they do. But this is very taxing on computers, especially at a quantum level. With a quantum computer though, this would be right up its alley. And not only would it have no issues simulating these diseases and viruses, but it would also be far more accurate, making medical advancement a breeze. Quantum computing is an amazing thing. Scientific technicians are working closer and closer to this, and believe it or not, it's predicted that we should achieve this in a matter of just 20 years. Imagine what we could do. Space travel, time travel, faster than light travel, exploration of other planets, medical advancements, and really, there are so many things that the quantum world has to offer that we have no idea what to expect. We just have to wait and find out, and I would love the opportunity to one day use for myself this amazing leap in human technology. Seriously, imagine PC gaming on that monster. <laughs> Whew.